All right, so we are going to go ahead and do our PowerPoint and audio lecture for chapter 12, Stress and Adaptation. I love this little picture here to the right. So um, this will make more sense when you guys get to your nursing diagnoses chapters. But this says nursing diagnoses, excessive stress related to chronic exams, secondary to nursing school as manifested by uncontrolled crying, extreme exhaustion and hysteria. That's all of you. <laughs> all right, so what is stress? Okay, what is stress? Any disturbance in a person's normal balance state is stress. Um, a stressor is a stimulus that a person perceives as a challenge or as a threat. It differs for all people. Um, it disturbs this person's equilibrium by initiating a physical or emotional response. Stress can keep you alert and it can motivate you to function at a higher performance level. So some stress is good. On the other hand, if you become too anxious, you may be unable to focus on that task or to think clearly. And that's when it becomes a problem. So along with stress, stress there comes with coping responses. So coping responses, um, their mechanisms or the way that our body seeks to maintain equilibrium or homeostasis to make us feel at ease and at our normal baseline, okay? Um, so these, these coping responses reduce tension, they reduce pressure, and they reduce emotional strain. And then adaptations, these are changes that occur as a result of coping responses, okay? And we'll get a little deeper into that here in just a moment. So there's different kinds of categories of stress, okay? So there's distress. Distress is bad stress. This is, um, this is stress that threatens your health. Then there's eustress. Eustress is literally good stress. It is protective to us, okay? There's developmental stress. So these stressors, these can be predicted to occur at various stages of a person's life. So in a sense, developmental stressors may be easier to cope with because they're expected and a person has some time to prepare for them. So for example, expecting your aging parents to pass away. Okay. Um, and then there's situational stress. So these are unpredictable. So these can occur at any stage in life at any age, and they can affect any age group. Okay. We all know this, an unexpected death in the family, perhaps. Um, and then there's time stressors. So these can lead to angst over the lack of opportunity to tend to all the things you have to do. I'm sure that we are all experiencing time stress right now in nursing school, right? Common examples of time stress include worrying about managing multiple demands and rushing to avoid being late to work or to an appointment or worrying about... Um, uh, worrying about getting to, to work on time because you just had so much to do this morning. You had to get the kids up. You had to get them ready for school, blah, 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 right? That's a time stress. So anticipatory stressors, these are the ones that you experience concerning the future. So sometimes this kind of stress can be focused on a specific event, such as an upcoming exam, perhaps, or a clinical day, right? Um, anticipatory stress can also be undefined, such as a vague sense of concern about the future or a feeling that something will go wrong. Um, an example, like I said, a, an upcoming exam or clinical day for a nursing student, or maybe you have a public speaking engagement and you're just like super, super stressed and nervous about that. And then there's physical, physiological stress. So these kinds of stressors affect a body structure or function. So those kind of stress, like a chemical stress, so that would be ingesting poison or ingesting medication that may stress your body or taking tobacco that stresses your body, right? Um, so then physical or mechanical stress. So trauma, um, cold stress, if it's too cold, hypothermic conditions, that will stress your body. Joint overuse, that could stress your body in a physical way. Nutritional stress. So if you have a vitamin deficiency or a really high fat diet, that can stress your body. Um, biological stress, so viruses or bacteria can stress your body. A genetic stress, so inborn errors of metabolism, some kind of genetic issue. Or lifestyle stress, so obesity or a sedentary lifestyle, that can all put stress on your body as well. And then there's psychological stress, so external stressors that arise from work or family dynamics, living situations, social relationships, or other aspects of our daily lives, right? 
Um, so now we know about our stress. So what about our coping? How do we cope with stress? So on page 240, you'll see coping strategies um, and, and their behaviors that and techniques that are used to manage our stressors. So there's two different kinds of coping strategies. Strategies. There's adaptive coping strategies. So healthy choices, okay? These are um, an individual who's recently been diagnosed with hypertension may react by modifying their diet and exercising more often to lower the blood pressure and prevent com complications. That's a healthy choice and adaptive co coping strategy, right? Um, maybe a good support system. So these Good support system can help a person adapt to stress, provide emotional support, encourage expression of feelings, and help that person solve problems, right? So adaptive is problem solving in a healthy way. Maladaptive coping strategies. This is an unhealthy style, and this is typically a temporary fix. So some individuals choose an unhealthy way to cope, like overeating or drinking or drinking alcohol excessively or smoking or a drug of choice or something like that. Okay, that's a maladaptive coping strategy. So dealing with stress, okay? Okay. So three general approaches for coping, depending on the situation, right? So these are our three, our three options, okay? We can alter the stressor. So in some situations, a person can take actions to remove or change the stressor. For instance, changing jobs. If your job is stressful, we're going to alter it. We're going to get a new job then, okay? We could adapt to the stressor. So adapting involves changing your thoughts and behaviors related to the stressor. So maybe changing your thoughts about nursing clinicals. Okay, you don't like them, but maybe just saying, you know, I might not like them, but it's going to be really good for me. I'm going to kind of try to change my outlook on that. Or avoiding the stressor. Okay, you may find that being with a certain person is stressful for you, even though you've tried many times to change the dynamics of the relationship. So maybe in that case, it's best to end your relationship with that person. So avoiding the stressor altogether. Okay, and then there's adaptation, right? So successful adaptation allows for normal growth and development and effective responses to change, to change and challenges in the daily life, right? That's a successful adaptation. Okay. It's a possible and it's a desired outcome of stress. We adjust to the stress. Okay. Um, the outcome depends on the balance between the strength of the stressor and the effectiveness of that person's coping methods. Okay. So even with a positive attitude and good coping skills, excessive amounts of stress can lead to maladaption and disease. Right. So successful adaptation allows for normal growth and development. And it allows for effective responses to life's challenges, okay? But again, the ability to adapt depends on a variety of things, the intensity of the stressor, the effectiveness of your coping skills, personal factors. Some people succumb to illness after experiencing only a few stressors, whereas others seem to adapt to multiple intensely difficult stressors. Each person has a different ability to tolerate stress, but everyone has a breaking point at which stress becomes too overwhelming. So factors that are going to influence adaptation to stress. So the person's perception of the stressor, right? So a person's perception of the stressor may be realistic or it may be totally exaggerated, right? If a person's adaptation attempts to be successful, um, if, if previous adaptation attempts have been successful, then they maybe try it again. You could just found something that has been successful for you. So you keep trying it again. That's a person's perception of the stressor and what has worked last time. Maybe it will work this way this time. Okay. And then overall health status, that's going to influence adaptation as well. So stressors may actually cause a healthy person to engage in, um, constructive adaptive behaviors that improve their health. Okay, so a person who's just discovered that they have hypertension or high blood pressure may react by modifying their diet and exercising, right? Like we talked about. And on the other hand, if a person finds out that they have hypertension and they've been coping for years with pain and immobility from arthritis, um, they may be too overwhelmed and exhausted to take any actions to lower their blood pressure, right? So the overall health status is going to influence that. Support systems will influence it. So a good support system can help a person adapt to stress, provide emotional support, um, help a person solve problems. Um, the stronger the support, the better the adaptation. Probably the lesser the support, the less the adaptation, right? 
Um, it may also provide financial and other concrete types of support, such as a place to live, meal preparation, household help. Families and support systems can help with all of these things. And hardiness. So people who thrive despite overwhelming stressors tend to have a quality that has been termed hardiness. Okay, that's what they have. They maintain three key attitudes that help them weather adversity. So these three attitudes are commitment, control, and challenge. Okay, so commitment lets them seek to be involved with ongoing events rather than feeling isolated. Control enables them to struggle and to try to influence outcomes instead of be, be, being passive and feeling powerless. And challenge allows them to perceive stressful change as an opportunity for learning. Okay. Um, personal factors that may influence um, adaptation include age, okay, um, developmental level, and life experience, such as um, learning when coping methods have worked for you and using them the next time you encounter stress. So physical responses to stressors, okay? So um, there is the general adaptation syndrome, okay? Um, so this all has to do with the physical response to stress. So in the general adaptation syndrome, it has three stages, okay? Um, so what this is, it's a theoretical model of physiological responses to stress. It is non-specific bodily responses shared by all people. We all go through it, okay? And it's a response to distress as well as you stress, bad stress, good stress, right? So it involves three stages. So it involves the initial alarm stage, and you need to know these. You need to know these different stages and what happens in them. Um, so it involves the first stage, the initial alarm stage. The second stage, which is the resistance stage or adaptation. Um, and the third and final stage is either recovery or exhaustion, depending on how they adapted or did not adapt. So here's a great visual for you. So in the alarm stage, that first stage of the general adaptation system, this involves the stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, okay? We know that's our fight or flight, okay? Our sympathetic nervous system. So it increases the release of these hormones. Hypothalamus secretes CRH. The posterior pituitary secretes endorphins and ADH. The anterior pituitary secretes the ACTH, the adrenal cortex, cortisol and aldosterone, and then the adrenal medulla. So the adrenal medulla is important in this one because it secretes epinephrine. In that alarm stage, it secretes epinephrine. We know what epinephrine does to us. It makes us jittery. It makes us hyper-focused. It makes us uh, feel, it's that feeling of stress, that feeling of anxiety um, that we get when we're scared, that initial response, okay? That's that epinephrine, okay? And then that alarm reaction turns into that fight or flight for us, right? And then we go into our second stage. So our parasympathetic activity, it balances parasympathetic activity and sympathetic activity. Hormone levels return to normal. And then we go to adaptation. If you adapt, then you go directly to recovery. If you do not adapt, you go directly to exhaustion. Okay, and that's where alarm reaction recurs or continues endlessly until the energy is depleted. And this person cannot adapt and subsequently dies. Okay, so that's just a general overview. Let's get a little bit nitty grittier into these different stages that you need to know. Okay, stage number one, this is the alarm stage. Again, fight or flight in the epinephrine. Okay, so the fight or flight response in the alarm stage has two phases, shock and counter shock. Okay, so phase one, the shock phase begins when the cerebral cortex first perceives the stressor. Okay, it sends out messages to activate the endocrine and sympathetic nervous systems. Epinephrine and other hormones prepare the body for fight or flight. Okay, the shock phase does not last very long, usually less than 24 hours, sometimes only a minute or two. Okay, so that's the first phase, the shock phase. Um, phase two is the counter shock phase. So all changes produced in the shock phase are reversed, and then the person becomes less able to deal with that immediate threat. Okay. In the alarm stage, you've got all these involuntary body responses going on, okay? Think, think I'm getting chased by a grizzly bear, okay? All these changes are happening. So in the endocrine system, 
the hypothalamus is releasing CRH. CRH together with the messages from the cerebral cortex is directing that pituitary gland to, re to release ACTH. This gets really complicated as far as all the hormones that are going to be released, okay? But you need to know that there is a, there is a process from this fear and this um, stimulation of the nervous system that, that happens in this nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, all of that, okay? And so what happens? What happens once all of these chemicals are and these hormones are released in the body, okay? So it goes to the sympathetic nervous system, releases epinephrine and noepinephrine, okay? So what happens, after that happens, what happens in the cardiovascular system? Okay, so we're thinking we're being chased by a grizzly bear. So this is our alarm stage, our initial stage. What's happening to our cardiovascular system? So the heart rate and the contraction force is going to increase, right? Our heart rate's going to go up. Our peripheral and visceral uh, vasoconstriction. So our blood vessels are going to constrict. That's going to increase blood flow to all of our vital or organs because we need them to run away, right? So our brain, it's going to go to our brain. It's going to go to our lungs. It's going to go to our muscles so that we can run. Okay. Our blood volume and blood pressure is also going to increase. And then the blood clots more readily in this time because it's preparing for an injury, right? So that's the cardiac system, the respiratory system, what's happening in the respiratory system. So our bronchioles are going to dilate. This is going to increase the depth and respiration and tidal volume. This makes oxygen more available to diffuse into the muscles, the brain, the cardiac cells, because we know we need to breathe. We need to breathe really good because we are focused, right? That's what's happening in our body during this time. Um, the metabolic system. So what's going to happen there? So the metabolic rate increases. The liver converts more glycogen to glucose, makes it more available for energy because we need to run, right? Um, it, Except in the brain, the body uses less glucose for energy. So the brain uses more, the rest of the body uses less because it typically needs less at this time. Um, they use the use of amino acids and the mobilization of fats for energy increases. So all of these things together provides more nutrients for the body to be able to sustain that activity during this time. The urinary system. So blood flow to the kidneys decreases and they retain more sodium and water. Okay, so do we really need to pee when we're in the middle of running from a grizzly bear? No, so we are gonna divert that blood away from this unneeded activity at this time and put it where it needs to go, okay? Um, the gastrointestinal system, so peristalsis and secretions of digestive enzymes decrease because do we really need to poop right now? No, we're running from a grizzly bear. So we're gonna divert that blood away from that area. And then the musculoskeletal system. So blood vessels are going to dilate, increasing the flow of blood and thus oxygen and energy to the skeletal muscles because we need to run away. So all of this is what's happening at an organ level in your body during this alarm stage. So now we're moving, we're done with the alarm stage, okay? That either lasted 24 hours or one to two minutes. It just depends, okay? So now we're moving into stage two, the resistance stage. So this is the coping stage where the body tries to cope. It tries to protect itself from the stressor and it tries to maintain homeostasis, okay? Stabilization involves the use of physiological and psychological coping me mechanisms. The body decreases cortisol release and the blood pressure begins to normalize in this stage the vital signs start to normalize. If the person adapts successfully or if the stress is combined to a small area, then you will go back to homeostasis, okay? If the stress is too great, such as serious illness or severe blood loss, then the defense mechanisms fail and the person enters the third phase of the general adaptation syndrome, okay? So failure, you either adapt in this stage or you fail to adapt. And then you get to the third stage. So if you adapt well, you end up in recovery, okay? If you do not adapt well, you end up in exhaustion, okay? So with exhaustion, the stress isn't stopped and the body's adaptive mechanisms are used up. The patient goes into exhaustion. Physiological responses in this stage includes vasodilation, so our blood vessels are going to get bigger, which decreases our blood pressure, 
and increases our pulse and respirations. So a trauma patient, for example, who was resuscitated in the ER and went to surgery in ICU. Okay, let's just use that as an example. After a couple days, maybe the patient's blood pressure drops and they have an increase in heart rate and respiratory rate. That's, that's them entering that exhaustion stage. Okay, that's how you know it's exhaustion. Their heart rate increases, the respiratory rate increases, the blood pressure drops, okay? It's exhaustion. Physical adaptive resources and energy are depleted and the body is unable to defend itself and cannot maintain resistance against the continuing stressors. Exhaustion usually ends in injury, illness, or death. Okay, that's your exhaustion stage. But if you successfully adapt in stage two, then you're gonna be led to the recovery stage. So. Um, for example, after a big trauma, if we get the bleeding stopped and we're able to stop other injuries, we can support their body's recovery efforts. They will be able to recover. Okay. So that was the general adaptation syndrome, right? So that general adaptation syndrome is the whole body result responding to a stressor, the entire body. The local adaptation syndrome is a localized response. Remember local means confined to like one area. Most common that we deal, deal with as nurses are a reflex pain response and an inflammatory response. Okay, so talking about the reflex pain response. So this is the withdrawal of a limb from painful stimuli. Okay, you touch a hot candle, you touch a hot burner, you pull your hand away really fast. Okay, that's a protective local reflex. That's your local adaptation syndrome. You're adapting to that stressor. And then the inflammatory response. So this is a local reaction to cell injury. So this process includes other different phases as well that we'll talk about here and you need to know. So um, with the inflammatory response, the different stages. So again, local reaction to cell injury. So the vascular response, that's the first phase the first phase of the inflammatory response is the vascular response, okay? During this, injured cells release histamine, which increases blood flow to the area, okay? Then kinin is released by dying cells and causes fluid to move from capillaries into tissue spaces, causing edema, okay? That's your injury, right? You get swelling, you get redness, your leukocytes, your white blood cells move into the area to fight the infection. Okay, that's the first stage, which is the vascular response. Your second stage is the cellular response. So this is when your phagocytes go to the area to kill off or wall off those past pathogens. Your third stage of this inflammatory response is exudate formation. Okay, the white blood cells and extra fluid ooze out from that area, a serous sanguinous fluid, okay? And then the fourth stage is healing. So tissue is repaired or regenerated. Okay, so you can just think about your reflex pain response. You touch the hot stove, pull your arm away, right? Then you get into the inflammatory response, right? Because you just touched a hot stove. So now with these four stages, this is what's happening at that inflammatory response. After you touch that hot stove, what's gonna happen is your, your body's gonna go through the inflammatory response and the stages of that, which is the vascular response the cellular response, the exudate formation, and the healing. Those are the stages of that that you need to know, okay? Then we've got psychological responses to stress, okay? So these include feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. How do we respond psychologically to stress? So anxiety and fear, right? So anxiety, this defines, this is defined as a vague, uneasy feeling of discomfort or dread accompanied by an autonomic response, okay? So typically a feeling of apprehension caused by the anticipation of danger. We think something dangerous is going to happen. An anxious person worries. They feel nervous, uneasy, and fearful. They may be tearful, and they often have physical symptoms such as nausea, trembling, sweating, things like that. And then fear. So fear is an emotion or a feeling of apprehension or dread from an identified danger or threat or pain, even. The danger may be real or it may even be imagined. 
Okay, so anxiety and fear initiate the release of epinephrine. Both of those release epinephrine. This stimulates the sympathetic nervous system and prepares a person for fight or flight. Therefore, living with anxiety can be physically, emotionally, and spiritually exhausting. It's exhausting. Okay. Um, another response. So ego defense mechanisms. These are unconscious mental mechanisms that make a stressful situation more tolerable by decreasing the inner tension associated with the stressor. Okay. So just as the body responds to um, physiologically, responds physiologically to stressors, it has psychological responses that protect the person from anxiety to assist with adaptation as well. When these are used sparingly and for mild to moderate anxiety, defense mechanisms can be helpful. However, when they're overused, they become habits that give us a false illusion that we're coping. Okay. If um, psychological defense mechanisms are inadequate to diminish the threat and restore that homeostasis that we need, the person may develop an anxiety disorder. And we'll talk a little bit more about those defense mechanisms in the next slide. So then another response to stress, so anger. So when expressed appropriately and clearly, like verbally, anger can be adaptive because it temporarily releases a person's feelings of tension. Okay, so when anger is out in the open, both parties can deal with it. Nevertheless, even verbal expressions of anger can be destructive if the anger continues after the person expresses it. We see this in the hospital all the time. Patient may accuse of a accuse us of not caring for them properly and get very aggressive and angry. How we deal with this is that we're going to determine how the situation plays out, right? So as a nurse, if I minimize the patient's feelings or patronize them, it's going to be a mess. If I say, I'm sorry, then I've opened up a can of worms that can lead to litigation, right? I'm accepting blame. I say, I did not care for you. That's kind of what they would probably hear with that. So if I say something that recognizes how the patient feels and tries to get them into a dialogue, the situation typically gets better. For example, Mr. Smith, you seem really angry today. Can you help me understand what's going on? That right there is a perfect example of therapeutic communication. And that needs to be considered when you are asked on your exams or on your NCLEX about questions involving communication. You always want to validate their feelings and you always want to ask them to kind of elaborate. Okay. Always, always pick that option. Okay. When you're faced with that kind of a question and you will be. Okay. Um, and then there's depression. So this is sometimes associated with unresolved anger and can result from stress. So it is normal to feel depression in response to a loss or traumatic event, but long-term depression is a reason for concern. Let's see. Okay. All right. So getting into our defense mechanisms, you do need to know these and know the difference of these. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to mention a few common ones, but please take a look at the table and make sure you start to grasp these ideas. Okay. This table is located. It's table 12-1 on page 246 and 247. Okay. So I'm going to mention these, these few important ones and we'll kind of go over these, but there is a large table that you need to cover in your book. Okay. So rationalization, this is the use of logical sounding excuses to cover up or justify true ideas or true actions or true feelings. Okay. Things like statements like this, it was God's will, or I'd be a better wife if I didn't have to work, things like that. Okay. Then there's denial. Okay. Denial is transforming reality by refusing to acknowledge thoughts, feelings, or desires. So these are typically unconscious. It's not consciously lying. And the first, it's the first defense to learned by a person. So a person with alcohol abuse can say, I can quit anytime I want to. That's denial. Okay. Then conversion. So this is emotional conflict that has changed into physical symptoms that have no physical basis. So somebody having nausea and diarrhea prior to a big exam. Okay. It's, it's converted into physical symptoms. Displacement. So this is called kind of like kick the dog, right? So you're transferring emotions from one original situation into an, to an inappropriate person or dog or somebody that's less powerful and threatening. So you're going to blame the nurse or the hospital or the spouse, or you're going to come home and kick the dog because you had a bad day at work. That's displacement. 
dissociation. So this is painful events that are separated from the conscious mind. So a person who was sexually abused as a child describing the events as if they happened to her sibling instead of herself, that would be dissociation. Um, reaction formation. So this is a person who is aware of her feelings, but acts in ways opposite to what they're feeling. So it's okay that you forgot my birthday when it's really not okay, right? That's reaction formation. And then repression. So this is unconscious and it's burying or forgetting painful thoughts, feelings, memories, that kind of thing, pushing them from a conscious to an unconscious level, unconscious level. It is a step deeper than denial. It's related to denial, but repression is a step deeper. It submerges those painful thoughts. For example, if a person doesn't remember the events of the night, his wife had a heart attack and passed away at a local restaurant, just doesn't remember. Okay. So consequences of failed adaptation. Okay. So um, continual stress is a result of repeated circuits of repeated central nervous system stimulation and elevation of certain hormones. So continual stress brings about long-term changes in various body systems. Okay, it's not good for us. People who use maladaptive coping strategies, such as overeating or substance abuse, they create additional stress on the body and that further contributes to disease, right? So that's one of those stress-induced organic responses or consequences of failed adaptation. So continual stress. Okay. Repeated central nervous system stimulation, elevation of certain hormones. Okay. Then we move into somatoform disorders. So somatoform disorders, these are conditions characterized by the presence of physical symptoms with no known organic cause. So they are results from unconscious denial repression and displacement of anxiety. Okay. The symptoms allow a person to avoid a situation that if it was confronted would provoke extreme anxiety in them. This is more common in patients with personality disorders or major psychiatric illnesses. Examples of some somatoform disorders include hypochondriasis. So you've heard of somebody being called a hypochondriac, right? That's this. Okay. This person is preoccupied with the idea that he is, or will become seriously ill. Okay. This person is abnormally concerned with their health and interprets real or imagined symptoms unrealistically. They have a fear that they will become worse or incurable and they're not faking it. They're not faking it. Anxiety about the health may trigger these physical sensations in these patients. Then there's somatization. So in this disorder, anxiety is emotional. Anxiety and emotional turmoil are expressed in physical symptoms. So the loss of function, the pain that changes location often in depression. Okay, that's kind of somatization. The patient's unable to control the symptoms and behaviors and complaints are very vague or exaggerated in this disorder. Then there's pain disorder. So this is emotional pain that manifests physically. So pain is the main focus of this person's life. The level of pain the person states is typically inconsistent with their physical condition. That is the physical cause is either disproportionate to the pain or cannot be found at all. And the pain does not typically change locations in this one as it does in somatization. And then there's malingering. So this is different from other disorders because it is a conscious effort to escape unpleasant situations. So for instance, a patient may merely pretends to have symptoms for personal or tangible gain. Okay. So maybe they pretend to be sick so that they can call into work. That's malingering. Okay. And then stress induced psychological responses. Okay, so even when defense mechanisms are effective, they eventually run out and fail. So prolonged stress can lead to the following. Crisis, this is a big one that you need to know. So in a crisis, there's five stages of crisis. A pre-crisis, the impact, the crisis adaptive, and the, and the post-crisis. That's four, I meant four. A crisis exists when one, an event in a person's life drastically changes the person's routine and they perceive it as a threat to themselves. 
okay? A crisis exists when an event in a person's life drastically changes the person's routine as they perceive it a threat to themselves, okay? That's the first thing they need. The second thing, the person's usual coping methods are ineffective, resulting in high levels of anxiety and the inability to function adequately. Typically, it's something that is sudden or unexpected, a serious illness, a death of a loved one. The number one priority when you have a patient that's facing a crisis is to ensure client safety and nurse safety, okay? Because typically, these people are inconsolable. They are just acting totally belligerent because they are so overwhelmed and in a crisis, okay? Um, and then there's burnout. So burnout occurs when nurses and other professionals cannot cope effectively with the physical and emotional demands of the workplace. Okay. <clears throat> and then post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is spe a specific response to a violent or traumatizing event, like an earthquake or a flood or a natural disaster, um, or to some kind of physical or emotional abuse, such as rape or torture or war. Right. So the victim experiences anxiety and flashbacks that may last for months or years. OK. So moving into um, our nursing process, so our assessment factor. So we're going to assess the stressors, the risk factors and the coping and adaptation of our patient who's having a stressful time. Right. Um, by getting data about this person's stressors and risk factors, it's going to help us to determine whether the client has realistic or exaggerated perceptions of their stressors. Okay. Um, it's going to help us to identify interventions and reduce current stress and provide anticipatory guidance to future stress. Okay. We're going to assess their response to stress. We're going to need to assess their physiological, their emotional, and their behavioral and cognitive indicators of stress. That's part of our assessment. And we want to assess their support systems, right? So support systems, family, friends, coworkers. These are important in the success of a client's coping strategy, right? So this is important to ask, okay? Um, on page 252, you can see um, on there questions to ask a patient who's um, exhibiting lots of stress, okay? Moving on to our second stage of ADPI, right? So our diagnoses, okay? So stress is nonspecific, so there's almost no limit to the number of nursing diagnoses that can be stress-induced, right? Your theoretical knowledge of this nature of the stress should lead you to identify based on that, okay? So here's a couple of um, approved nursing diagnoses for these kind of patients. So again, physical, it may cause constipation. Behavioral, may cause ineffective health management. Cognitive, may cause impaired memory. Emotional, anxiety is one. Um, impaired parenting, hopelessness is one as well. So there's lots of different ones. Again, you can find these in your book as well as in your care plan book. Um, outcomes are going to be specific to the actual patient's um, typical situation. A very broad general goal could be to reduce the strength and duration of the stressor by a target date, right? Or the patient will show um, effective coping mechanisms by discharge date, something along those lines, okay? And so stress reduction interventions, remember, as I say a million times, when we're talking about interventions, we're talking about what are you gonna do about it as the nurse? What are you gonna do about it? So we're gonna do health promotion activities. So we're gonna promote adequate nutrition, okay? It's, it's essential to maintain the integrity of the immune system. Proteins are needed for tissue building and healing. In addition, overweight and malnutrition are stressors that may also lead to illness, okay? We want to teach our patients to limit the intake of sugar and avoid highs and crashes and salt intake to avoid that raise in blood pressure, okay? These are important aspects of nutrition when dealing with stress. Um, we want to promote regular exercise. So that promotes physical homeostasis by improving muscle tone and controlling weight. Okay. It also improves the functioning of the heart and lungs, can reduce the risk for cardiovascular disease. It can also, um, it can also release endorphins, which are actually known as endogenous opiates, which create a feeling of well-being. 
We want to promote rest and sleep to restore energy levels and about allow the body to repair itself and promote that mental relaxation. Most people need seven to eight hours of sleep a day. Um, stress, pain, and illness may interfere, interfere with that ability to sleep. So we need to make sure we're on the lookout for that. We also want to teach them how to relieve anxiety because it's a common response to illness, medical tests, and treatment. So we want to teach them how to relax and do guided meditation or calm themselves, do breathing exercises, things like that. Um, we want to help the patient manage their anger. Anger is a common response to stress. And typically our patients don't just come out and say, I'm angry. In fact, they may not even recognize that they're angry. Instead, they just engage in angry behaviors. They may become hypocritical, hypercritical of family members or caregivers, become verbally abusive or physically demanding. Um, we wanna teach stress management techniques. So relaxation techniques, again, meditation, visualization, acupuncture, things like that. Massage, that would be nice. Um, and then a change in the perception of self. Okay. We want to help our clients recognize their negative focus and restructure their thinking into more realistic ways. We want to encourage positive self-talk to help increase their self-esteem. And we also want to make sure we advise them to avoid maladaptive coping behaviors. We don't want them to use excess alcohol or excess caffeine or sweets or smoking or illicit drugs, anything like that. Um, we want to use specific interventions to relieve anxiety. It's a common response to illness, right? So we want to use relaxation techniques, things like that. Anger management, we talked about that. Stress management, this is a repeated slide, it looks like. Yep, that's a repeated slide. So we've already talked about this. Moving on. All right, test your knowledge. So the nurse should assess every client to determine if stress reduction intervention should be a part of the plan of care. The rationale for this action is that what? A, there are more persons experiencing mental illness now than in the past. B, life is so much more stressful than it ever has been. C, the occurrence of stress in clients is unpredictable. Or D, the clients often develop maladaptive coping strategies. The answer here is C, the occurrence of stress in clients is unpredictable. So we as a nurse should assess every client to determine if stress reduction intervention should be a part of the plan of care. Okay. All right. All done with this one. Thank you.